All right, everybody, welcome to Cyberbulls. So this is a show about Tesla and a show about investing. The big question we're going to ask today is why is Tesla stock falling? So we have a guest bull with us today. His name is Tom Nash. Tom is a financial expert. He provides opinions on the stock market, the economy and financial news. He previously worked at a major fund and 10 years at Deloitte. Very, very popular YouTube channel called Tom Nash TV. So Tom, I've got to ask you the question. You know, you did a video recently, something like Tesla sucks, <laughs> but only for people who don't know the business. So first question we want to ask you is why is the Tesla stock crashing, Tom? Well, when in doubt, zoom out is the first thing I'm going to say here. And it's probably the most important rule in what I say is the right way to invest, which is long term investing. If you take a look at the stock price and you zoom out, so year to date, we're up almost 100 percent on the stock. So we started the year with about 100. We're all you know at 200 and change. So if you stayed in the stock at the very least for almost a year, you've doubled your money. Now, if you've been speculating the stock and if you've been buying and selling and trading and trying to time the market, the market punished you. This isn't news. Warren Buffett coined this phrase among many <laughs> and among many that were attributed to him that he didn't say. <laughs> but this one he did say is that the market is a transfer mechanism from the impatient to the patient. The thing is, the longer you've invested in Tesla, the longer you've been a shareholder, the more money you've made. And the, difference are, the differences are insane. If you've been kind of the Dave Lee investor, it changed your life. Even if you've invested for the past few years, it's a life-changing money. You invested in the past year, it's still a good return. <laughs> and you've, you've doubled your money. So the stock is going to be volatile. It has a high rate of retail participation. So it's going to have volatility in it. That's going to remain the case until the institutional investors are going to get in. We can ask Gary Black when this is going to happen, and he will give you the same answer is when they're going to do the buybacks and when to have a key man plan in place and the same old Gary Black spiel. But the fact of the matter is the stock is going to be volatile on the short term as long as we have a high retail participation. But the good news are is that despite Tesla being the queen of the retail, it has managed to climb all the way up to the top of the, of the rankings. No retail-driven stock has ever done what Tesla did so far. In fact, I will just finish with this. The retail community of Tesla has proven to the world that simple, everyday retail investors do better research than institutional investors because Tesla proves that. And the people who had the faith in the stock, who were dollar-cost averaging when it was $100, $150, $170, are sitting pretty right now saying, well, we double our money. The ones who are crying about it are the ones who are trying to time it. And Tesla will really, really punish you for trying to time the market. And that's a good thing. I'm happy with that. Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. So just to introduce the rest of the bulls here, we've got Alexander Mertz. She's known as Tesla Boomer Mama. We've got Xander Sky, and we've got Jeff Lutz, and of course me. So I want to ask you just another question. You know, HSBC came out today with a note, and they said that, they see the auto business doing very well, but they uh, doubt that the other businesses, the other startups, FSD, RoboTaxi, um, bots, and others, is going to take a lot longer because of regulation. Uh, what's your kind of reaction when you might have read that today? I'm going to be very gentle and politically correct because it's not my show, so I'm going to be very, very <laughs> gentle. So I think uh, the sell-side analysts have proven to be uh, somewhat inaccurate as it comes with uh, with Tesla at least and similar shares and uh, similar companies. Uh, sell side analysts uh, are really good at one thing and one thing only, which is to communicate to you what is the sentiment right now today in the market about a stock. That is why you'll see a sell side analyst telling you this is a buy at 100 and then this is a sell at 30 within the span of a couple of weeks. It's not that their discounted cash flow valuation all of a sudden basically drops by you know three or four fold. What they do is basically they show you sentiment. As we know right now, the sentiment about Tesla is more on the negative side. So this is the end goal they have. And now they need to find a path to justify this end goal. And they make up some behoovy 
or baloney or horse manure, whatever you want to call it, about regulatory constraints. FSD is already deployed. It's already on the roads, and it's been doing phenomenally well. In fact, to the point where there's no clear second. I don't even know who's giving me second with full self driving. This thing is going to be exactly, exactly what they did with superchargers when they became the quasi-monopoly in the industry standard. It's already deployed, so I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Sorry for the French. Um, and the, this idea about robotics, look, what kind of regulatory constraints might this, this thing has? It's so far away uh, that I don't think any evaluator of Tesla is actually putting in proper robotic revenues right now in their models. So that impacting their, their models just seems to me very unlikely. So what I think they're doing here, and with all due respect to HSBC, is I think they've decided the sentiment is negative, so they need to drop prices, and they're making up stuff that fit to this narrative. Anybody who is familiar, sorry, just one more said, anybody who's familiar with FSD, the potential of FSD, just listen to what Ron Barron said. Don't listen to Tom Nash. I'm a YouTuber. What do I know? I'm just a guy. Ron Barron, who manages $50 billion, said, what, six days ago? FSD is going to be to the auto industry what Intel chips became to the computer industry. And I think he's 100% right. So HSBC versus Ron Barron, I'll take Ron Barron. I want to ask a question here to Alexandra because uh, Tom used some colorful language. He used French, <laughs> so you can reply to him. <laughs> but also because you're an ex-fund manager, I wanted you to reply back to your understanding of how institutional funds or whatever Tom has said so far. Um, I, I actually really like what Tom said, and, and I agree with him on a lot. Um, at the moment, Tesla is still underweight in most funds. You know, I do my daily tables. Those are the rare funds that overweight Tesla, and they're, they're not big other than the ARC funds. So um, institutional investors staying away. If you ask to different market participants why that is, Gary thinks it's too volatile, a couple of other things. People think they just hate Elon too much, whatever. Could be all true, but they're going to miss the train. I mean, the, the one thing we have as an advantage over all these people is as a retail investor, you have the one and only currency that matters. And that is time. If you have time to sit this out, if you have time that you don't need this money in three or six or 12 months and just can wait for it and can see the different scenario. And you're right, Tom, they, they don't even phantom yet uh, including robotics into their plan. Yet we know Tesla is already recruiting a night shift for, for the bots to assemble the bots, to test the bots. And when you read those uh, job offerings, it is actually so that they will be efficient on the factory floors. So yes, it may not be something they sell straight away, but it will be something that will actually help them with their cost cuttings because they will replace workers and they will be at a, at a, a completely different uh, efficiency level. So all this um, to say that, you know, if you don't believe in the Tesla waves, how I call them, you know, the first wave being the cars that is coming now to a point where margins are getting a little bit um, tighter until the second wave, which is FSD and RoboTaxi heads in, the third wave being the bots and so much more to come, all the services, uh, the, the software as a service and, and all these other services linked to it. Um, I just do believe that most people just see, don't see the forest from the trees. They're just, you know, taking it at their, at their true value, don't want to mess with it, find it expensive there because all they see is the car business, which is traditionally a low margin business. Um, and, uh, and, and so are, you know, not willing to put more weight into it. It's all for our gain. You, you can't help these people. That's the rules they have. They think they have choice. And you have to understand they are judged on a daily basis. You know, they are compared to the different funds. They have to tell their management, you know, how well they're doing. They're getting their bonuses paid uh, depending on their fund uh, performance. And they don't have the time we have. Okay, but I need to ask both of you guys. <laughs> We need the institutional investors, right? I mean, yes, the retail investor is a good majority of the investors in Tesla, but we need to get the institutionals. I think the last time I saw the stats, we have the lowest of the MAG7 of institutional firms buying into Tesla. And I know you said a few things here, um, Tom, about the, you know them not understanding. What will they? We need to do, or they need to figure out. Well, first of all, they'll understand us. Why do we? Why do you think we need them? Why do you think we need them? I mean, there are uh, oh. three million shares outstanding. 
So what, you know, what, sorry, 3 billion, what do you think we need them for? Those shares are all, you know, in circulation. They are in the hands of Elon for 14% of them. They're in our hands for the rest. What do we need retail investors for? I actually, in the current expansion period, uh, prefer for voting rights at the shareholder meetings, much more that these shares are in the hands of retail investors than of some crazy disappointed uh, institutional investors who can then lobby together. Remember, we had all these discussions uh, when some people wanted to become board members, and obviously that went nowhere. But uh, but at the moment, I don't see a, an immediate need of having institutional investors in here. They will come late, and they will stabilize it. I mean, just a scenario. I mean, it's not going to come, but just playing with it. Warren Buffett purchasing, yeah, that will stabilize the 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 institutional base. There will be lots of people then adhering to the to the stock, and that will take out the volatility of the stock and all that. But if you do, if you can stomach the volatility, if you see it actually as buying windows, it's nice that that is still yet to come, but I'm not in a hurry for that to come. And Tom, correct me if I didn't put that oh, right. Shocked. Okay, I've learned something new because I thought <laughs> I learned from you that you need the institutional investors because they have the big money once they start flowing in. And then I also thought that it was the opposite of what you just said, that they actually create the, they're less likely to pull in and out like an, a retail investor. So very cool that you said that. Uh, Tom, did you want to add to anything? And then I want to get um, the other's opinion as well. So the idea with the institutional investors and the, I think that they're net positive. The, uh, what, uh, what, what Alexander said is it, it, it has merit. You see, uh, institutional investors, they bring some good and they bring some nastiness. Like everything in life, there's a it's a yin and yang, right? So I think overall, institutional investors are net positive for companies that are publicly traded, because I think that overall, uh, the majority of them add stability to the float, and they kind of uh, make the water a little bit more tranquil. Um, but uh, what I will agree with uh, Alexandra is that the uh, the Tesla retail community have really shown uh, durability. They buy the dip. They stabilize the stock. So again, that level of retail uh, education and retail stability and just the uh, absolute confidence in in the, in the stock is something I've never seen before. Uh, Tesla is the first time I've ever seen it. Uh, I think that the, it will happen very, very soon. I think what's holding them back, as, as Gary said, I, I agree with him that buybacks is the one thing that's holding them back because buybacks is kind of walk to walk, right? If you're saying to me that you know the stock is cheap and you're the company, show me that you actually mean it. That's the mindset of the institutional investors. It's very hard for them to, to acknowledge the fact that Elon is answering and is saying, look, I get it, but I'm a better capital allocator than you. If I give you the money, <laughs> then I can't allocate the capital and I'll do a better job for this company and for you if I hold the cash instead of giving it to you. That's the debate. But at some point, as Elon indicated himself, there will be buybacks the minute this happens. They will get in. They'll stabilize the float even more. Uh, but again, that's why institutional investors, they don't make the big bucks. Uh, that's why the retail investors, guys like Ron Barron, they're the ones who are making you know, the crazy amounts. It's Their business is kind of to play defense and be risk averse. And that's okay. I'm going to go to uh, Xander next because he's the is the epitome of the retail investor or what I think is a stereotype of a Tesla investor. He sold his house. He's all in. Uh, and he's like deep research into the space. So what's your thinking about all this conversation, Sander? Um, the institutions, according to uh, Webull shareholders as of uh, October 31st, is actually 45.59%. And insiders is 14.45%. And others is 3996 So that's us. Um, I, I do like the, you know, what Alexander was saying and Tom. Um, if if institutions you know finally can kind of set the bottom and um, and we see earnings going up, I think that the time is coming that they will step in and and uh, you know ho and hold it. So um, it's just kind of a you know as Tom said, you got to zoom out and and look at the big picture. Um, right now, earnings aren't uh, you know a catalyst for us. So it's the other things that as the story. Uh, is believed, then we'll, we should start seeing some uh, positive, uh, you know, momentum. Okay. Let's get to Jeff. Um, what's your thinking? Why the stock is down, or any conversation we had so far? 
Yeah, I think it's hard to, and I agree with the statements earlier too, I think it's hard to any one day to just pin it on it's this or it's that. I don't think HSBC carries the kind of weight uh, that some may may prescribe to them. You know, there's a number of things happening. Today. Actually, all the EV stocks were hit uh, pretty significantly. Um, so I never kind of prescribe it to one thing or another. But in terms of the institutions, they're going to want to see you know, you're going to see gross margins stabilize at some point and, and figure out like where this business is going to to settle and 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 get on, you know, a, a different trajectory again versus EPS, you know, estimates declining. And I think we're I think we're coming to that point very soon. And what's always intriguing and interesting to me is for these institutions that are out or for these investors that are trying to trade or not investors, traders that are out and trying to get in, how do you know when to you know, when to get in, because, you know, you, you can talk about 2024, we're, we're two months, we're actually less than two months away from 2024. And as soon as we get into 2024, what are they going to talk about 2025? And, you know, you'll have a Cybertruck ramp, you'll have the new model three fully, you'll, you'll have all these different things happening, you'll be closer to this $25,000 vehicle, you, you know, you, we may have, you know, FSD out of, you know, beta and running. I mean, there's a number of catalyst and you know it gets to the point where wherever you're at and then your your call it a six or 12 month look ahead changes pretty drastically with this stock so if you're in january or february you're going to be starting to look ahead at 2025 and you're going to see uh the ability for tesla to grow and you're going to see continued capitulation by Tesla's competitors, because in a high interest rate environment, they haven't been able to invest and design a vehicle that has positive unit economics in, zero, in a zero interest rate environment. What makes it, and they've already announced that they're not going to invest in this high interest rate environment. So they've really pushed off their EV ambitions. And for whatever reason, the market isn't connecting the fact that if all these other people are not building EVs at their promised rates and this EV adoption curve, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute, continues growing, which there's no indication that says it, it won't, who's going to deliver all those vehicles? And I just don't think the market has connected those things. And by the way, Tesla hasn't told the market yet to connect those things. Okay. So we've covered um, the question of Tesla, why is it down and what can make it go up? But the, uh, the next topic here is on AI. I want to ask you this, Tom. And then we'll also cover the FUD that media is doing for Tesla. It's just continuing to grow. EV demand, is it going up or down? <clears throat> Again, the FUD is saying that it's, uh, you know, it's winning out there in the market, you know, the, the mindset of what people are thinking out there, and then Elon Musk himself. So, Tom, with AI, um, you, you and I have had this conversation be before, and you've been following it closely of when is this AI boom that happened the first half of this year, when is that going to kind of start be attributed to Tesla and Tesla being seen as an AI company, especially after the Grok announcement just weekend, the supercomputers that are growing, just the advancement that Tesla is doing. Um, what's your thoughts on that? You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, I think markets have been generally laggy on the attributing uh, tech to Tesla. It's kind of funny to see it happen again and again, and people just uh, keep missing it. So I think now, now we have a consensus where everybody, uh, even the kind of uh, haters, so to speak, of Tesla are admitting, well, Tesla is not just a car company, right? It's a consensus. Nobody's claiming that Tesla is just a car company anymore. Well, nobody that matters, right? If we go back, you know, three years, just three years ago to 2020, that would have been a very controversial statement to say. What do you mean Tesla is more than a car company? They only make cars. So I think that Tesla has always kind of been ahead of the curve. And it's it's funny to me because all this information is out there and everybody's seeing it. And let's put let's put it in perspective. Okay. What is the what is the uh, I guess the the best way to get to AI dominance, right? AI requires data, right? The more data you generate. The more the more you advance uh, your kind of uh, AI system, right? So, name me a company that's generating more AI data right now than Tesla in the real life environment. People forget that uh, FSD in itself, FSD is an AI tool that's being built every day and it's getting better every day. 
and it's getting better faster than 10x faster than anybody else. So uh, in the context of Tesla, I have no doubt that they will be the number one uh, you know, AGI company in the world. I think a lot of people understand this right now, but it will be lagged and most traditional investors will be complaining about the high valuation, the high price to earnings ratio, the high price to sales ratio, and they will not do the proper research like guys like you, like Alexandra, like Jeff, like Xander, like everybody else are doing, uh, that are looking at the technology and they're saying, guys, this is revolutionary. I mean, look at how many how many miles they're creating with the FSD. FSD is is a is an AI system. I mean, for goodness sake, this isn't this isn't driver assist. This is a thinking, adjusting, learning machine. So I I think it's going to take time until that becomes a consensus. And by the time it becomes a consensus. The stock is going to be much more viable. You know my position on the stock. I've, I've said my piece on that. And I think people will miss the train again. It happened in the past. It will happen again because people have this. They've read one book in which uh, they've been told, well, you know, 30 PE is too high for a company. Or <laughs> this is a, and they'll go by these numbers and they'll ignore the research. They ignore the data. They ignore the fact that the guy who's running the show is literally the epitome of Midas. Everything he touches becomes gold. You mentioned Grok. Let's talk about what what he did with X, formerly known as Twitter. Let's talk about what he did with Tesla, with SpaceX, with Neuralink, with Starlink. We can go on all day. I mean, uh, at some point, uh, you know, there's this, I, I don't want to take too much time, but if you take this uh, kind of spectrum and you take the timeline from, uh, you know, zero to 10 years, the longer you stay in the stock, the more it's going to uh, correlate with the technology. So Tesla always had this huge gap between the quality of technology and the price of the stock. And, you know, at some point, this gap is going to close. And Tesla already closed the first gap when everybody understood, well, there's energy, there's all this stuff. Now they're opening up a second gap. Right now, as we speak, 2023, a new gap is opened with AI being misunderstood. That gap is going to close. It's going to make a lot of people rich. And a lot of people are going to be complaining and then saying, well, we couldn't have known that Tesla is going to, you know, 10x again. Love it. Love it. <laughs> You're so good. You're you, you're very unique, uh, Tom. I like you because you're you sound really super bullish. You're very uber bullish in everything you've said so far in the first, you know this episode. But actually, you're not an uber bull. You're kind of very measured, uh, and we've had that discussion before. So that's why I love to hear you say things you say. <laughs> yeah, people complain on the one. Uh, everybody hates me because the <laughs> the the bears hate me because I'm too bullish, and the uber bulls hate me because I'm not bullish enough. That's my <laughs> usual existence. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, that's good. So uh, let's talk media FUD. So that's the next topic here is like uh, just a lot of things happening. Jeff, why don't you, you've been following this very closely. Tell me what's the kind of FUD that you've been reading and uh, tear it apart. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I'll get right to it. It's really all centering on the fact that We've got, we've done this transition both in 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 uh, TV media or video uh, and in print media from the competition is coming in EV to nobody wants EVs anymore and it literally happened overnight and it happened um, right as the the major you know U.S. EV leaders and now we're hearing a lot of um, you know a lot of negative sentiment from EV leaders in or car car leaders in in Europe regarding their plans to build EVs and you've had Ford GM and VW announce pullbacks both in in existing capacity as well as in um, in future uh, capital expenditure and what what I found uh, most interesting was the one well, there's going to be many interesting points here and I think we're going to have some some, uh, I think we'll go to EV adoption a little bit later, but um, the, the, cent the, the central piece is um, Tesla opened up their charging network this summer. The major EV leaders stepped up, had, had basically the equivalent of a press conference with Elon talking about how great this is, how it's removing a barrier uh, for people to buy EVs. And then, you know, as they progress throughout the year, they keep their prices high in their EVs. They see their their inventories ballooning. I even sent some uh, over some some even more recent data, um, but now it's looking like it's even in the last couple of weeks, EV uh, inventories of non-Tesla 
vehicles are now creeping up well over 100 days. There's a range. There's about 15 models that are showing somewhere between 120 and 330 days of of inventory. And you know, so it's it's just interesting. Overnight, we've we've gone from this transition of no, you know, the competition's coming. Therefore, Tesla is not going to, um, you know, have as you know, you know, not be able to sell as much to you know, the competition's here, but now nobody wants EVs and now they're not investing and nobody's connecting the two. And then the final thing is why this is FUD is, is there's never a chart. There's never data that's put on the screen. It's literally conversation, whether it's your favorite CNBC personality, it's like, well, we're hearing that people don't want these things. But when you actually go to the charts and data, and and I think that maybe in a later section, Herbert, um, when we actually go to the data, the data doesn't support anything that what they're saying. The data says that these um, this competition basically built and shipped into inventory and could not move product out of inventory into consumers' hands. That inventory ballooned and it allowed them to actually get market share by ballooning their inventory because they get credit for shipping from their factory to a dealership. So that's that's kind of where we are right now. While Tesla is increasing production about probably 15% from the last quarter to this quarter. And they've got industry leading inventory uh, under 15 days. Remember that 15 days includes Model S and X. Um, so if you really look at a, a, a vehicle like the Model Y, it's even gonna be lower. Do you guys think that it's the, the tax are just gonna just balloon now, even more so than it's always <laughs> always has been? Because if these EV companies, these I'm sorry, these legacy auto companies, are delaying their plans, they're going to be more forceful about attacking, don't you guys think? Yes. <laughs> uh, can I yeah, be gonna, I mean, there's you? no, they don't have an answer. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Response. So, I, I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Jeff, I love your work, by the way. I never had a chance to tell you this, but I've been following your work for a while and I absolutely love your takes. Uh, so I wanted to say something clear here. And uh, there's a PSYOP going on against Tesla. Mm-hmm. And it's important to understand the the mind games that are being played with people. It's the same thing they've been doing with crypto, and now they're trying to do this with the with Tesla. So, in the the when the big auto companies thought it's going to be easy to build their own EVs before they actually tried, they pushed this narrative: "Oh, we have the best EV, Super Bowl commercials, lots of this ad spend." And then all of a sudden, they find out: "Oh shit, this is way way too more diffi- too difficult than we thought." We can't make a profit on this. This is like we don't know how to scale this, et cetera, et cetera. All the story you guys know. There's no need to elaborate on that. Then all of a sudden they say, "Okay, hold on a second. This isn't a good business for us. We don't know how to do this." Okay, let's start pushing the new narrative. The new narrative is like, uh, "Why would you want an EV?" And then send uh, Peter Zehan out there to explain that there's not enough lithium in the world or some other behoovy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, there's no, there's not enough resources, and they start start building this narrative where you know there's not enough demand for it, et cetera, et cetera. Look, people are just too smart for this. This is 2023. We have X. We have social media. We have Reddit. This isn't going to work. The idea is very, very simple. Look at the numbers. Model Y is selling just as much as a Corolla right now, the best-selling car in the world. So to, uh, look at the Cybertruck reservation. Look at the, how much vehicles on the road right now. Uh, and by the way, right now you got the Israel in the news because of the war. Look at how many Teslas over there. Look at the percentage of uh, of Tesla, of the entire EV market there, and the overall number of cars they're selling. Look at Norway. Look at the UK. Look at Europe. To claim that Tesla has a demand problem, I think it's uh, highly misleading. What I think they're using is a general slowdown in macro, and I'll explain. And this actually works to Tesla's benefit, and I have my note here. And I've put down the sentence and said, bad times are good for industry leaders. And and I'll explain. If we are indeed headed to bad macroeconomics, which uh, may be the case, who knows, right? If we're going to a bad market where people can afford less less cars and less expensive cars, who's going to get hurt the most? The people who are barely hanging on by a thread, who are carrying out ball and chains of hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, who, who can't make a profit on EVs, who barely make a profit on the regular cars, who just agreed to overpay for their employees by another 30%. The... Those people are going to survive or the company that has the best margins in the business, the best employees in the business, 
who are working. This is like the Rangers in the army. It's what the, like elite employees. Ron Barron just quoted what like thirty five hundred employees, over three point five million applications, a mountain of cash, virtually no debt, and zero ad spend. Who's gonna survive the the bad times? I, I want to use this example. I don't want to take up too much time here. If we're all my one of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump, and yeah. in Forrest Gump, there's a very famous scene. One of my favorites where uh, Forrest sees uh, Lieutenant Dan and he jumps out of the boat and he swims to him and then he forgets he's not you know steering the boat and the boat rams into the into the um, you know into the uh, into the into the pier. But eventually, what happened is that there was a huge storm and every single boat in Biolabatter got destroyed except Jenny, which was uh, Forrest's boat. And then he became the shrimp king of, of America with the Lieutenant Dan because he's the one that survived the storm. So if if Ford and GM uh, either get demolished or have to consolidate or have to readjust because of bad times, uh, it's pure Tesla game. So I don't see the problem with bad macro for Tesla. In fact, I see it as an advantage. Yeah, there's other data that supports Alexandra, that statement. Alexandra, you're on mute. Oh, Go oh, ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Go ahead. Just uh, in... 10 seconds. There's other data that supports that. In the great financial crisis, there was a 36% peak to truck drawdown in US auto, macro auto. Meanwhile, secularly, the EV adoption curve is growing anywhere, you know, 50% plus in the US. So there's there's data that supports in the worst and the biggest drawdown in the last three decades in the US auto market, which by the way is over capacity now by 30 or 40%. On the other side of this uh, strike, any but if that market draws down, you know, again, if we nobody's predicting a recession that's going to be as worse than two thousand eight or nine, but even if it was, you know, to your point, the, the growth in EV and the growth in Tesla would be able to outstrip that or at least uh, keep their heads well above water. Yeah, that was actually my point when my mind didn't work. Um, the question is, is there a recession or not? I mean, I'm not worried at all about financial strength of, of Tesla. You know, I do every quarter of my tables, uh, comparing them to all the mega packs, uh, mega caps and and, um, and the other uh, car makers. And Tesla is clearly one of the two strongest financial strength ratings um, last quarter. And I'm sure it's going to be as much, if not better, this one. But um, the, the point really is, uh, are we in a period of where we have a recession or not? And I would like to hear Tom on that one, because I think this is, with my old age, the weirdest recession I've ever seen, right? I mean, we're coming out of this pandemic, we're still having a consumer that is surprisingly strong, yet all alerts are on credit cards, uh, defaults on cars, first foreclosures in the real estate. We have an unaffordable real estate market. We have a collapsing commercial real estate market. It's the weirdest thing ever. And um, so, yes, Tesla is well armed if we really get into a recession. But are we getting into a recession? That's the whole question. Yeah, it's a good question. Look, uh, people forget, but uh, we had lots of recessions uh, over the past uh, 70 years. Uh, we had at least 12 or 13 of them, uh, it, me meaningful or meaningless uh, we had the S&P 500 uh, drop 50% twice in the past 20 years. People kind of forget that. 20, let's say 20, 22 years, including the dot-com bubble. Uh, so talking, there's a few things here to unpack. So I'm, I'm going to start with the end. Um, if you go back 100 years on the U.S. stock market and you stayed invested in the U.S. stock market for over 15 years in a row, sometime during those 100 years, right? So 100 years and you've invested for 15 years in a row sometime during the 100 years, your likelihood of losing money is 0.02%. So there's a 99.8% chance that you've made money if you stayed for 15 years in a row invested in the US stock market. And that's based on the last century of data. And that's super important to understand. So there's no reason to freak out because recessions and stock market crashes they happen all the time. They're not the end of the world. And there's ways to handle this. The, the, the question here is, are we headed to recession or not? Is a, It's a really important question. Because look, uh, the US economy went through 11 rate hikes in a row. 
This is really, really un uncharted territory, at least not since the Paul Walker days uh, back in the 70s and 80s. 11 rate hikes in a row in any other economy would have meant a, a crisis, uh, a depression, recession, you name it. But we're now looking down the barrel of a 5% annualized GDP growth, which is insane. A very healthy employment market, uh, virtually no unemployment. The stock market is what S&P 500 is 15% up year to date. We're almost done with this year. So on the, on the surface, it looks great. Uh, but yeah, if you dig under the surface, you find out lots of credit card debt. You find a housing market that is uh, stalled because of high interest rates. People aren't moving real estate. Nobody's selling, nobody's buying. You see a lot of defaults. You see a lot of kind of advanced warnings for bad times. Now, I will only say this, I don't have a crystal ball. And as a Yogi Bear once said, you know, predicting is very hard, especially the future. But the one thing I'll tell you is because the U.S. economy is, is uh, the most resilient economy in existence for many, many reasons, which I will not specify here. But the cards are not dealt fairly on this global table. And the U.S. economy can take a lot of damage. They're like the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers. They'll bend, but they won't break. So if I had to bet... I think there's more likely than not chance that we're not heading to a serious uh, recession in the U.S. economy, despite the punishment that we've put the system through. Having said that, whatever happens is the same playing field for everybody else. And I'm going to say this point again. The one company that's going to survive this out of the entire auto industry, if you want to classify Tesla as an auto company, is Tesla. Who else is going to survive? Probably Toyota is going to survive. Probably VW is going to survive. I don't know what happens to Ford and GM. They probably have to consolidate. So we win if the times are great. Tesla does really well. And we win if the times do bad because Tesla will go down, but the other ones will go down more. And then Tesla will clean up the entire market once it goes back up. Very, very simple. Tom. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. Let, let me let me set you up, Xander. So I wanted you ask you a question, Xander, uh, because uh, you are somebody who follows the stock market closely. I wanted to have you tell us what you're seeing in the stock market and how they're uh, interpreting what, whether or not the, what's going to happen or not with the recession and so forth. Yeah, we, we've had, uh, you know, quite an increase in the S and P uh, over the, like the last 10, 10 trading days. So um, it, it seems like a healthy pullback is, is necessary. Um, and um, you, you know, for, for I, I keep going back to Tesla and trying to, you know, find the floor. Um, you know, we, we had a gap here uh, from 206 to 212. So I, I called this out yesterday uh, with, with my options trader people. And, um, and you know, it was kind of surprising that they went for it uh, today. Uh, so, so you know, I, th I think Jeff made a good point that you, you can't attribute it to one thing. But uh, as we know, the options market is, uh, you know, Tesla's the, the greatest position. So, uh they did that. Now there is a uh, a two forty uh, two thirty uh, to two forty two uh, gap left on the top side. So um, you know I'm kind of hoping that we we go revisit that uh, with with some catalysts. Um, you know may, maybe some macro data uh, next week. Uh, so um, but overall historically uh, end of the years, especially uh, pre election year, you do have uh, like a Santa rally that, that's supposed to happen, but uh, you know t Tesla's macro is is really uh, pulling it down. So um, you, you know, with with what they guided, which was actually leads me to my question uh, to Tom: uh, uh, Do you think uh, Elon overreacted um, from what he said on the earnings call? What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Zander. Uh, I think yeah, a, a little bit. Look, I'm 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 not one to criticize uh, a billionaire that succeeded in everything he's done ever and has made some incredible things. But I I'll say I I don't know if it's not a calculated thing. Sometimes uh, you'll take the short term punishment to under promise and over deliver, and uh, you know overextend a little bit on the warning. And on the macro situation, just as a precaution, because if things go way better than you expected, you kind of manage the risk, right? So he might have been uh, downplaying uh, the his his ability to withstand this or overplaying the you know the macro severity of things. I'm not going to rule it out. I also am not going to rule out 
that he might have been in a bad mood. This is Elon we're talking about. You can't have the good with the bad here. So he's a very peculiar guy and he has his quirks and he might have just had a bad day. I mean, you like you take Elon with the, with the good and the bad. You take him, you know, with the personality that he is and, you know, it might have just been a random kind of a little bit of a tantrum. The, for me, when I see this thing happen, look, and I'm going to divide it into two points here. Number one, when I see people overanalyze uh, his bad mood on the call, and basically sell off a stock that has a beautiful setup for the next 15 years. To me, it's an opportunity to buy more. No problem. I'll buy more. I don't think Elon is having a bad day. It affects my uh, dollar cost average strategy or my or my uh, discounted cash flow valuation or any other metric that I have for the stock. Uh, if I look at macro, I think that uh, if, again, I'm not disagreeing with Elon here, but I'm, I'm seeing uh, something very positive in the macro world, at least from an inflationary standpoint. Now, uh, we are now looking at you know almost you know almost four percent inflation. Today we heard Jerome Powell speak. He's saying, well, we're still you know adamant about going down to two percent, and we're going to keep on pushing. But I think it's just lip service, and I'll explain why. If you actually, and I don't want to, I don't want to make it into a macro discussion here, so I'm going to keep it brief. It, the CPI without gasoline and shelter is now at two percent. If you take away gasoline and shelter CPI, we're already at two percent. Shelter has been. Uh, let's say artificially inflated because nobody is selling the interest rates are too high nobody wants to sell nobody wants to high gasoline is high because we had a lot of tension uh, geopolitical tension which seems to be dying down we, we you know the world was thinking we're going into this world war three scenario it seems not to be the case right now so as we go deeper into winter there's less travel gasoline will keep coming down uh, as we go down in interest rates which the fed will have to do in the beginning of next year that there's going to be more incentive for transaction activity in the real estate market, so we'll see you know lower pricing. I I think the Fed is done, so I don't I don't see any more rate hikes. I see only declines from here. Maybe in the beginning of next year, as this happens, it's going to affect the market very positively, at least in the short term. So uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it, there's a good chance that they've managed to soft land this thing. Even I didn't believe they can do it, but. It seems like it, but hey, there's a lot of signals to the other to the other side as well. As Alexander mentioned, a lot of debt in the in the in the retail sector, a lot of credit card debt, a lot of defaults. So it's still too too soon to to say we did it. But don't forget the student loans, right? They have to start repaying. That's gonna be a bitter, bitter pill for a lot of people. Yeah, but that's one hundred percent true. But also when uh, you start repaying the student loan. It's a dis disinflationary element because you have less disposable income, so it also will bring down spending. And so mm. there's a flip side to this as well. But I 100% agree. Uh, but again, do you see them doing it in an election year? Uh, well, I mean, it yeah. starts. It starts now. They can't. They, they can't uh, cancel it again, right? The problem. I mean, I can't believe that some of those student fund managers or whatever you call them, you know, the ones that are cashing and whatever are not ready. I mean, can you believe that? This was a break of three years. They apparently should have started and started and started over and over again. Now they should finally start. And now their IT is not ready. I mean, I have, I don't want to be the conspiracy theorist here. I don't know. In an election, let's see. I, until they start paying it, I don't know. I need to see it to believe it. Mm, yeah, it is. It is very. It's the Russian so. in me. I am always. <laughs> it's already started, Tom. The, this yeah. the, the October November was already the first payments. Yeah, yeah. I know. But I mean, okay, not, so not they're all actually paying. Already. Yeah, well, they, that's a big thing. There are lots of them actually not paying, and one of what? the main cash machines, well, the ones that which should got it, is is not ready IT wise. So uh, look, I I think that the. Look, the question the question I think really that needs to be asked here is not whether uh, you know the the market is going to go south or not. I think the real question should be is mm -hmm. uh, how Tesla will behave in this environment. And I think that's going back to my original point. Uh, the beauty of this is like almost like uh, when you buy, let's say the S and P five hundred as a long term investor, you kind of think whatever happens, I'm going to make my eight percent a year, right? Hmm. With Tesla, you're saying, look, whatever happens, you know, I'm I'm good in the bad times. I'm good in the I'm really good in the good times. Uh, that's why I never understood people who allocate a capital to companies with, like Lucid. It's like it was always kind of this conundrum to me. It's like I was talking about this with other friends. It's like it's like 
why? It's like, mm -hmm. look at the risk profile, look at the upside. I can understand why people are thinking about Rivian, potentially, maybe I can make a case for Rivian. But uh, in, in, in the bad macro, you're talking about a company with the lowest cogs, with the mountain of cash, with no exposure to any sort of uh, credit issues, no debt, with the, the best CEO in the business. So how can you bet against it? I've, I've never <clears throat> understood this. It's probably the least sensitive company to, uh, to macro, uh, except perhaps Salesforce, what? which is what? like a pure B2B. Whoa. That's surprising you just, you because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> did you just Interest say rate? that Tesla, Tesla is the least sensitive to macro? Yeah, with the exception of my favorite company, which I'm not here to talk about. So I'm going to leave Palantir? it to the side. Yeah, yeah. But oh, it's not the on. point of this podcast. Well, I'll tell you why. I don't want to make this about Palantir, but uh, this, nobody here wants this. It's like, it's, it's the equivalent of me taking off my shirt. Nobody wants to see this. But, <laughs> but I'm just going to point one sentence. Palantir has 50% of its business coming from the government, and that's going to stay yeah. solid. So I'm not, yeah. I'm just saying, right. I'm putting Tesla in the same category as Palantir. As even, as... Though, even though car financing is so dependent on interest rates? Well, look, here's the thing. The people who buy Teslas are not the people who buy the, 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 the uh, it's socioeconomically. The, the, the typical client, the demographics of the clients who buy the Tesla cars are usually not ones to uh, get hammered. To finance? Oh, I think you're, you're mistaken there. I think 70 to 80% of Teslas are financed. No, no, I, I agree with that point. I'm just saying, I'm not talking about the, whether they're buying cash or not. Nobody's really buying cash anymore. I'm just saying that their socioeconomic position in a in in situation where that isn't an issue for them. So they don't default as much as... A, a well, I, I mean, I'm I'm watching very closely every week the swap lease and, and, and all these people who, you know, who bring used leases to the market, which have between 12 and 36 months still outstanding. And the rebates that some of the Teslas have to give now, I mean, obviously for two reasons. First of all, the, the new price is much lower than the price they engage yep. their lease in. And then the second one is they obviously want to get rid of it because if not, they wouldn't have it on the swap of lease. But, uh, but, but it, there are some people in dire situations. Yeah, but uh, the one thing I'll tell you is all my friends who, uh, who bought Teslas, uh, uh, who never owned Teslas before, they've all said the same thing. We never thought about a, a car expenditure as a, as, a, as a saving. That's the, the mental exercise that people are not used to making. Like if you buy a Tesla, your maintenance costs, your gasoline costs, all of these get offset of the initial purchase price. So a lot of people, when times go bad, they'll make the initial investment because the ongoing payments, the, there's no uh, transmission, there's no engine oil, there's none of this crap that... Uh, it's basically, uh, it kind of maintains itself for, for years. So there's, there's Yeah, a, and brand there's loyalty. Metal. Brand yeah. loyalty is enormous, no doubt about it, yeah. So I'm saying it's also a saving. When you buy a Tesla, yes, sure, the initial entry cost is high, but your monthly payment on a Tesla is so much lower than a normal car. Correct. Uh, yeah, so that's part of it. Okay. Whoa, okay. Well, let's, let's talk. The next topic here is EV demand, right? We were talking about the FUD. We were talking about does macro impact uh, purchases. Jeff. Tell us what's actually going on. Is EV demand, EV demand falling or not? Just like this CNBC is telling me what's going on. Yeah, this is, again, this is the FUD transition we're going through of the competitions coming to nobody wants these things anymore. And if you remember two things from this conversation, one is when you're being told these things, they're not accompanying it with a chart in any kind of analytical set of data to support their statements. They're literally just putting rhetoric out there and they're not supporting it with data. And the second thing you should take away is the, if you look at the, if you pull the covers back on the inventory, uh, it's actually even much worse uh, than what they're describing. So why don't we, um, if we go to the first EV adoption chart uh, that we had, Herbert. Um, yeah, this, is, this comes out from a source called EV Volumes. And uh, they're on Twitter as well. And this is this is showing um, global EV adoption. And basically, this curve is continuing to go up and to the right. Now, some years or some quarters, there will be differences in um, in that rate or the, or that growth. Got it. But in general, this this uh, chart is going up and to the right, and we're we're already at twelve percent basically globally 
and this and this continues to grow, being led really by uh, by growth in China. Um, if you go to the if you go to the next one, that's that's fact. This is fact. This is data. So now, if you start looking at um, Tesla and you start looking at their share, I'm not I'm I'm not a fan of looking at. EV share inside of EV share because the whole thing, as we showed you, is growing pretty significantly. But there's a, a pretty you know solid explanation of what's happening here, and it's going to and we're going to see it in the when we get to the next chart. What you've seen happening is Tesla grew and peaked up to this 22.6, and essentially they're going to keep you know this chart isn't going to continue actually going down too far for a bit. It's going to stabilize, and what's happened over the last two quarters is there's been more models introduced by the competition and what they do is the, those models leave their factory and they go to a dealership and once they leave their factory and go to a dealership it counts as sales for them i want to be very clear it leaves their factory it goes to a dealership and it gets counted as market share it gets counted as share so when we started this year legacy ev was at roughly somewhere between 40 to 60 days of inventory, basically on par with their ICE business. Tesla, as you know, runs anywhere between 13 to 16 days of inventory, much, much less inventory. They're turning that rapidly. And as, as Deutsche Bank introduced, uh, when they interviewed Tesla management in September, Tesla even said that, of that half of that inventory is in transit, and that's very important. That means what's available to sell is probably closer to the seven or eight day range. Keep that number in mind when we put up the next chart. Um, and in this chart, this is uh, pretty fresh data, data. I think it was posted by, um, it comes from Copilot and car dealership guy posted this on Twitter. This is this is the who's who of what's shipping. Uh, and, and if you look in, in, in North America and really globally, um, but this is really more of a North America uh, manufacturers and European manufacturers. And basically, this is this picture has gotten worse over the last several weeks, and this range of vehicles are anywhere between 119 and 327 days of inventory. So, I think Cox Auto put Legacy EV somewhere on the order of just over 100 days of inventory. So that would be at the the lowest end of that chart. This chart says that this 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 number is actually getting worse. But here's the final thing. Even if you put them on 100 days of inventory or 120 days of inventory, that means they've built what they needed for the next four months of sales. So when you actually look at their market share and you look at their total sales, and let's say you, you want to look at it over the next six months, well, they've already built and shipped for you know four months of that, and they don't want to keep four months of inventory. They only want to keep two. Um, so when you look at their, so when you look at, let's take, take U.S. Uh, market share, for example, basically Tesla ships about half of the EVs now in North America, and the other half is this very long tail from the competition. But that very long tail from the competition, now that we see that chart, they ship from their factory in the inventory. And if you were actually to take their inventory and normalize it down the Tesla inventory, what you would find is Tesla could easily if if they had to hold 15 days of inventory, they had to hold you know far less inventory. Tesla could actually have 70% market share if they ran their business the way forget forget you know direct to consumer. If they ran a, a 15 you know DOI business versus Tesla, you know it wouldn't even be close in terms of the market share that Tesla would 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 have versus what they're having. So these supply chains, these companies, they're not created equal. Any market share gain in EV that you've seen is basically them shipping from their factory in the inventory. And the reason is, is they're high priced EVs. They don't perform at the same value per dollar as what you can get from a Tesla now. So that's the story. That's the situation. They've seen this data. They get this data, although their latency is worse, uh, much far less worse. Their supply chain latency is far less more worse than what Tesla has. But they've seen this data, and that's why they put the brakes on. They don't have a solution. The other reason you put the brakes on, if you had a solution and something to jump to, what they would do is they would lower the prices, have a fire sale, and bridge to the next product. The problem is, is they're years away from getting to the next product. So if you were to take anything away from this conversation, one is the EV adoption story that you're hearing on TV, 
is not coming with data. When you actually look at the data, EV adoption is growing. Two, it's actually worse for the competition than what they're actually stating. The, the inventory is ballooning you know, much, much higher. And if you were to normalize it next to Tesla, Tesla is actually in a position, you know, this is why you have to look at these things kind of in retrospect, maybe over a year, year or two year time frame. We're going to look back on this period and they basically screwed themselves during this time period. And Tesla is actually going to be able to, to grab uh, some more share here in the near term and beyond. So I want to piggyback off of Jeff's great take, and I love that take. And I want to complete it from the other entrance to the house, so to speak, from the back door. So I'm not an expert like any of you guys on Tesla. I'm a spectator, but I understand money and I understand markets. So for me, the fear would have been if we were talking about, you know, range, anxiety, charging stations availability if this was the fear that was driving down demand i would be worried because this is systemic risk that is unsolvable right if people need to be more convinced about evs about charging etc etc luckily for us tesla solved this problem by creating the supercharger network so they've solved this this was the brilliance of elon seeing the future before it was an issue because nobody was thinking about, now it's like a gas station, it's everywhere. So there's no more anxiety. And it's proven, there's a, a recent a study, a, 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 sorry, a survey. I don't remember who did it. I think it was S&P Global Mobility, I'm not sure. But they did the survey and basically everybody said, no, 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 it's just the price. And why are they saying it's the price? And I'll explain. It's very important here. And I want you to be with me on this. In every new product that is introduced into the market, whether it's a brand new product or a feature, there's a pricing strategy that goes by waves imagine like an axis an x and a y and then you go down the the initial layer of the early adopters like you guys they pay a premium they pay a premium and they're willing to pay extra and then you go down one layer they're still willing to pay a premium but a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less and then you have to lower prices as you go down the levels into mass adoption it's just the normal development of any pricing strategy. Now, the crazy part about it is that Tesla and Elon Musk have cleaned house with all the first four levels. <laughs> Nobody else was on time to clear the first four levels. So let's say that there's 10 levels of market adopters, of, of uh, customers of, of vehicles, right? The first four levels of early adopters, of people who are excited about EVs, Tesla cleaned house. They dominate. They took, what, 70% of that market. Nobody else has anything left. Now, the market is in, in stage five. Stage five starts with normal people who don't care about Tesla. They don't care about EVs that much. They're like, they would like to have an EV, but they would not, they're not willing to pay an extra for an EV. You know, they're looking at this, well, this Tesla Model 3 costs this, and this, uh, you know, the, the Ford, the, this costs that. These guys, it's all about price. Now the price starts to play a factor. It needs to be competitive with pricing. But here's the crux of it, which is it's like the pe people need to understand the insanity of what I'm about to say right now. Tesla dropping prices to meet this stage is an offensive move. It is not a defensive move, which is what people don't understand. It's not a defensive move because what Tesla is doing here is it's dropping prices to meet the new layer of level five, level six, level seven, and it's dropping prices, but they're the only car manufacturer in existence who can afford to do that. None of the other guys can affordably lower prices. They cannot compete at the level that they are right now. They definitely cannot lower prices. Tesla can start lowering prices and still make a, sh a lot of, sorry, a lot of money on every vehicle sold. So they're slowly killing the rest of the auto industry by a thousand cuts. And nobody's paying attention. And the only defense that these guys have is wage a PR psyops war against the demand to get people to somehow buy these clunkers that nobody wants anymore. And I think I want to add something, Tom. I want to add something. I think Go they ahead. have a second. I think they have a second strategy, and people have heard me say that before, which is diverting to hybrids. The government has included hybrids, obviously they did the lobbying job, so, so that's there. There is still not enough understanding by the general public how 
hybrids are not the solution they think it is. Um, obviously, Tesla is not making an effort to educate at the moment. Let's hope that changes. Um, but they hope to win time by selling the hybrid models on which at least they don't lose money, on which they can use most of their construction experience, um, and on which they depend less on charging networks and everything else. So, so I think that's their way of trying to bridge the dire times they have. Not saying it's working, but uh, they do have a Band-Aid. I, I don't want to call it a Band-Aid, but just wanted to throw this in. Yeah, I want to add this thing. I just interviewed Nicholas Colas, right? He's got 30 years of experience with auto industry. He was a Wall Street uh, analyst and investor who actually helped with uh, Chrysler get funding to stave off bankruptcy, and he helped Chrysler to do the merger. He, he's made a very, very good point about this. He said that it's very unusual that Tesla took the strategy that they did. It's it's never successful when a new technology comes in to try to dislodge the uh, incumbent technology to come in at the high end, come in premium. Almost always, you have to come in with a low-cost, mass-produced vehicle. And that's what the Japanese did when they came in to conquer the U.S. market. That's what the Koreans did then with Hyundai. They come in with a low cost and eventually start building up the premium. And it's only like something like an Apple that really started at the high end. So for Tesla to have followed the strategy to get a foothold now that they're doing low cost offerings, that is the strategy to win mass market. So it's like, uh, you know, the, it's just a question of why do, do people think that they should be like Apple and stay at the premium? Or should you try to just completely get, you know, the goal is to get electric vehicles to as many people as possible, not to get the highest margin per se. Um, what do you guys think about all the things we just talked about? I don't want to hog the mic. I just, in existence... Yeah, no, there has never been a company except Apple that have been able to sell value and not sell price. That's the only time I've seen it happen. I don't think we'll ever see it again. So that that's just a very it's a unique uh, you know it's a unique situation. Yeah, I mean um, te Tesla has the room, as Tom said, and no one else does, and they're going to continue creating more room as. They they their supply base is stable. Remember, the legacy supply base is thirty to they were building twenty million cars in the US, twenty one million cars. So they're thirty to forty percent overcapacitized already. And they're gonna come out of this on the other side from the UAW strike, more expensive in labor and with less demand. And they're gonna their supply chain is actually in disarray. Not only the ICE supply chain, but think about their EV supply chain, which they stalled all this capital investment. That capital investment isn't just for their factories. It's also for their supply base. So uh, on the other side of this, this is these two things that need to at some point converge, which is Tesla has the room. Tesla has the volume. They're going to grow volumes probably 15% in Q4. And the thing that needs to connect is that people still want EVs. And there's really one player that's doing this profitably in the world. And when I think when those two things connect, and then you add the catalyst on top. I think you've got a really good recipe going forward. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. This was a fun show. You are, uh, I love your, ref just very refreshing take. Um, and I think you come It's with one facts. way to put it. It's one way to put it. There's other ways. <laughs> Try to be careful. I'll put it the way I put it, not the way you put it. You come with facts, but you come with attitude. And you promised me you weren't going to swear, but you didn't keep that promise. You spoke French. <laughs> well, thank you. I, oh, I, I, sorry. I screwed up once. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The you. entire show. I'm kidding. You. No big We've deal. But follow Tom it. on his YouTube channel, Tom Nash TV. Really appreciated this, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I recommend something for the audience? Yeah. Uh, follow everybody here. I love all of your work. Xander, it's the first time I've seen you, but everything you said today, I 100% agree with wholeheartedly, and I will follow you. Uh, Jeff, uh, I think you're awesome. Alexander, you know that I, I love your work at all. And uh, Herbert, we. Do they, know, do they know I'm your grandmother? Mother, not grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you're my, my mother, and uh, I, this shall uh, remain a secret.
Uh, of course. Yeah. It's just between us here on the show. Exactly. The same secret want... that they know that you are Tom Nash, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to say that uh, it's been a really a, a fun experience for me as well. You guys are super knowledgeable. It's a, it's a really inviting environment to come in and uh, to, to share this uh, insights with you. It's been absolutely a blast for me. Thank you, guys. See you later. Come Bye. back. Bye-bye. Bye.